the interventional cardiologist is stenting everything and even doing percutaneous valves. And he said, that is the future of medicine, minimally invasive, not open surgery. E-shadowing with my friend, Dr. Thipak Sudindra. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing well, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Long time no talk, and I, I got to, yeah. to hang out with your lovely wife. Was that last week or two weeks ago? Um, yeah. Got to, got to chat. Um, vascular and interventional radiology. It's uh, an interesting one that I think students will love because it's 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 a fascinating visual, hands-on, something that's like, it's more than just thinking, right? Thinking is fun and thinking is important, obviously, but it's like, it's cool stuff. It's kind of like video games and, and things like that. How did, how did you get into this world? Uh, well, you know, I, I really knew nothing about uh, interventional radiology as a medical student. You know, um, as you know, I did general surgery first and, um, I, you know, I switched uh, in my fourth year of uh, surgery training. Uh, but when I was uh, a fourth year resident, I, I remember I was uh, I was trauma chief, um, and uh, we you know we would get these uh, you know motor vehicle accident uh, uh, patients who had massive uh, hemorrhage, and what I noticed is during my uh, trauma time in a given month, I actually was not going to the operating room very much unless it was like a stab wound you know, or something. But a, a lot of the trauma was, um, you know, blunt trauma and either orthopedics would operate and our surgery would operate, would, would be on our service. And I was like, you know, they got to do all the fun stuff, <laughs> whatever it, it is that they did. I'm like, I'm sort of babysitting the patient now. Um, so that was sort of my first exposure to uh, interventional radiology, other than vascular access, getting a pick line or an abscess drain, which I think most medical students get you know, exposed to. Yeah. I, I'll ask now because I know a lot of students will have this question. How does one switch a residency? Well, that, that, that is a, that is a long <laughs> discussion. It is very challenging. Uh, let me rephrase yeah, it. Yeah. it. If you want to know more about you switching the box switching uh, residencies. Go listen to our specialty stories interview yes. where we, we dive into that a little bit more. Right. Let me ask, let me ask a shorter question. How, at, at what point did you realize general surgery was not for you to to really make that leap and go? I'm out of here. So when I went into surgery, I I never had an intention to be a general surgeon. Mm. So I, I knew that from medical school. Um, I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. It, it, general surgery was it was a means to an end. There's there's no way to do CT surgery without doing uh, general surgery. Mm -hmm. So um, it was uh, in my fourth year. He said, "You're you're going into plastics, right?" And the funny thing is, everyone thought I should do plastics based on how I operated because I was very you know meticulous. Uh, and um, and I said, "Oh no no no!" I said, I, "I'm doing you know uh, you know CT." And he looked at me and he said, oh, my God, I and he, he said, just, you know, you know, think, you know, think twice. And I said, why? And he said, you know, medicine is evolving. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you'll you always will need a, a cardiothoracic surgeon. But he said those days of where every community hospital had a CT surgeon, he said those days are gone. And the interventional cardiologist is stenting everything and even doing percutaneous valves and he said, that is the future of medicine, minimally invasive, not open surgery. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and so he said, you know, there's a, it, it's tough to, you know, even get a job. You know, I, this was back in 2005. Uh, he, he said, it's hard to get a job, you know, in, in CT surgery after like 10 years of residency training. And it really scared me. And, um, uh, and, and, and then some of my seniors who were CT fellows, uh, they could not get jobs. And that's yeah. when I said, you know what? Maybe I really need to, to think this. You know, I'm young. I need to be, I need to be on what's in cutting edge uh, medicine during my lifetime. So I said, you know what? Let me do interventional cardiology because I like the heart. And um, unfortunately, bread and butter IR is um, uh, tends to be procedures that are based on 
how do you how do you fix a problem? Okay, so bread and butter is someone who comes in with a blocked renal collecting system from a kidney stone. So they have urosepsis. And so we put it in a nephrostomy tube. We put in a feeding tube. Someone has a uh, GI bleeding. We stop that. Uh, someone, you know, someone has an ischemic leg. You know, we open up the blood vessels. Um, a stroke, uh, you know, neuro IR. Um, so we do, uh, you know, thrombectomy, we get the clot out of, you know, the, you know, the blocked vessel in the brain. So there are a lot of procedures that are done for in hospital patients. And those are sort of your typical bread and butter, uh, you know, uh, bread and butter, uh, cases, a thoracentesis, a paracentesis. So you have really tiny ones and then we have much larger ones. What, what's a big case for IR? So a big case for IR. So for me, the longest case that I've done is 14 hours. Um, yeah. People are like, what in the world? Like, you know, they haven't even been in an open surgery for 14 hours. So, uh, you know, my uh, area of expertise is uh, treating uh, deep vein thrombosis and the complications of DVT. So I get patients who, for example, their vena cava is completely filled with clot and has uh, completely scarred shut 20 years ago. And these people are miserable. They're in the- What skills are important to, to be a, a good IR doc? It's, it sounds like if you're going through little punctures, like how, how are you doing <laughs> all of that? Yeah. So, you know, I, you have to uh, be a, you have to sort of enjoy pu- uh, puzzles and, and solving problems. Now everyone say, well, you know, every physician solves problems. The way IR developed is actually interesting. It, it was um, how uh, we're sort of the doctor's doctor, sort of like the pathologist, but uh, on the uh, procedural side. So we, our specialty developed as a way to uh, fix problems, often that surgeons encountered that they didn't know how to fix surgically. And so that's how our field, you know, that's how our field developed. So um, I think you have to have a problem solving ability. You have to really think outside the box. A lot of what we do, you cannot find written anywhere in any textbook, in any article. It's things that we just make up right then and there. Wow. Interesting. That's exciting stuff. Um, the a lot of students are having problems. If you're having a problem with the connection, just close the tab and come back and hang out with us. Uh, there's a panic button, but I don't want to press it because I've never pressed it. <laughs> <laughs> they build in a panic button to this thing, and I'm like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Like, maybe make this platform stable that you don't need a panic button, which supposedly like kicks everyone out and restarts the whole thing and brings every. I don't know how it works, but I, I'm I'm scared to do that. So, um. With interventional radiology, uh, what what does that training path look like to be to become an interventional radiologist? So uh, the the traditional pathway was uh, after medical school, you have years. IR has be because it's become so competitive. It's become its own residency. So you know, prior to that, uh, you have to, the you got your boards in. Uh, diagnostic radiology, and you got what was called a CAQ or a certificate of added qualification in IR. It wasn't like a true board. Vascular surgery was sort of the same way. You got a CAQ in vascular surgery. Now, both those fields um, are our own boards. So now you have to apply directly from medical school to interventional radiology. Yeah. Oh, it's a lot. It's a lot. And and how long is the residency? Four years? It is uh, six years. Six years. It's a long yeah. time. And wh- what are you doing those six years? Are, are you rotating around in a bunch of different things? Are you doing all IR? What does that look like? So uh, generally, um, you know, the first uh, the first year you will do a surgery intern year. A lot of places are sort of mandating uh, uh, that surgery uh, year. And then you'll do uh, four years of diagnostic. Now, in, during that diagnostic, uh, in comparison to 
the traditional path where you did four years of diagnostic and then one year of IR and maybe, you know, just a couple months here and there of, of IR during that. There's going to be rotations that really focus on uh, the clinical management of patients because in diagnostic radiology, you're not getting that, uh, you know, that patient management aspect. And then you'll do a lot of uh, IR rotations uh, during those four years. And then during your fellowship, you know, year, it's, you know, it, it's a 24-7 IR. What does the future of IR look like with technology, with things getting smaller and smaller and smaller? Where, where are we going? So this is what I think is just amazing with, with IR. You know, um, when, when I was a surgery resident and I would do a laparoscopic gallbladder, I used to be amazed. I was like, oh my God, we put, you know, you know, three or four ports in and I took somebody's gallbladder out. Uh, now, you know, I'm like, I just completely reconstructed someone's entire vena cava and there's, <laughs> you know, just a couple punctures. Yeah. Um, but IR is really, to me, the, the future of, of medicine. For example, nanotechnology. You hear a lot about nanotechnology, gene therapy. Um, as to how those um, that future of medicine is, is going to be uh, done, let's say it would, uh, for a nanotechnology delivering something to a particular organ uh, for um, you know f- to treat a particular medical condition, who's the doctor who's going to be doing that? Most likely, it's going to be the interventional radiologist. You all the way down to the toes, we can put a catheter anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, so you can imagine you know what the possibilities are. That's that's super exciting. Uh, it makes it exciting for the future. In, in terms of skills for a student who's, who's potentially thinking about interventional radiology, what sort of 3D processing, visualization skills, what do they need to have going into IR, or can all of that be taught? It, it can be taught. You, you know, there is no way to know that before medical school, um, at least I don't think, you know, unless you're, you know, uh, doing some research or something in, you know, in radiology, but um, all in, in all of radiology, you know, the knowledge of anatomy, of course, is, is very important. And, you know, I used to think, you know, as a, as a surgeon, I was like, I know anatomy. You know, <laughs> uh, and, you know, obviously a surgeon does know anatomy. And he or she knows it from opening up the body and, and, and directly seeing it. From a radiologist standpoint, you're not opening up the body. But through imaging, you have to be able to, like you, you know, just said, you have to be able to look at something and three-dimensionally spin things around in your mind, you know, to know what different organs you're looking at. Uh, but, it's, but it's so fun. When, when, you, when you talk like that, I, all I can imagine, I, I don't know if you're a sports guy, but uh, all I can all I can picture in my head is the the way that broadcast now of sports will have one view of the action going on on the field and then they'll move to a different camera. They'll freeze where they're at and they'll they'll move to a different camera so you can see the exact same play, the exact same right. setup where they froze. But now you're looking at it from a different angle. And it's like, you're doing that kind of in real time, needing to process everything that you're seeing going, okay, I see what's in front of me, but I have to know if I'm looking at it from the other side, there's some danger there. I got to be careful. Um, and yeah. how, how anxiety provoking is that, that like you're, you're a, a couple of millimeters away from poking through an important structure. You, you are. That's why you have to, you have to be uh, thoughtful. Uh, you have to, think twice before you jab some sort of wire uh, in because you don't know, you know, you really don't know um, uh, where exactly that's going. So I think the, the anatomy that a radiologist and especially an interventional radiologist knows is really, uh, I think, um, uh, unmatched because we are looking those landmarks are so that I don't by accident jab a, you know, a, a blood vessel or an organ that I, I, that I shouldn't, you know, because that's how you're going to cause, you know, a lot of damage. Yeah, it's, it's important. Um, if you want to come on and ask some questions, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll start to line some people up, bring some people on to ask some questions. 
What do you, what do you love the most about what you do day in and day out? You know what? I, I feel like I go to, I go to play every day. Um, you know, I, it is, it is so fascinating. Eat every day is, uh, is different. Um, because I don't know what problem I'm going to be faced with that particular day, what problem the medicine team or the surgical team is going to come down and say, Hey, Deepak, you know what? We've got this patient. We have, we don't know what to do with them. Can you just come up with something that's sort of like the typical consult, you know, uh, you know, for us, um, they don't even know how to describe oftentimes what it is that they want us uh, to do. And, Um, And with that, you know, we have really developed a lot of very close working relationships with a lot of specialties. Obviously, our closest working relationship is with all the surgeons, Um, you know, but uh, the emergency room, uh, uh, internal medicine, OBGYN, uh, you know, we work very closely, uh, you know, with all these uh, specialties. So that camaraderie is, you know, is what I like. And there's something nice about being the doctor's doctor. Like, you know, if, if they, no one else can figure it out, you know, they're coming to me or my colleagues to try to help them in uh, surgical uh, specialties, uh, you know, that we, you know, that we work with. I personally, um, uh, I have a very unique practice, uh, you know, Many people, when they think of radio uh, IR, they don't think of IR as having a actual practice. They think that okay, these are just hospital-based physicians who they're just kind of told, "Hey, do this." Um, I see between twenty-five to thirty patients in my office every day. I'm sorry, not every day, uh, once a week. Uh, and sixty percent of my patient volume uh, are patients that are outside. Uh, of the tri-state area of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, you know, uh, Delaware. So I work at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, so patients come from all over the country to see me for their uh, vascular problem. They're self-referred. Wow. Uh, Interesting question from a student. How important is color? If you're colorblind, is is that a a no-go for IR? Uh, Absolutely not. Uh, Because, you know, everything we do is sort of, you know, uh, black, white, uh, kind of, you know, different shades of gray. Um, you know, so, so that is, uh, you know, that is not a problem. Yeah. Nice. And what about any advice for finding research within interventional radiology? There's tons of research, uh, going on. I I think it's more a problem of, um, you're going to have too many choices. So there are, uh, because IR is so can, uh, what we can do, um, cutting off the blood supply to, to tumors, um, there is uh, men's health, uh, prostate artery uh, embolization. There's, you know, so, so there's all sorts of different stuff. So it's really, uh, you know, just uh, picking one that is going to be of interest, you know, to the student. Yeah. It, it seems like IR potentially is more important uh, with wear and tear on the body. Uh, you mentioned the, the vena cava being closed and whatever caused that, uh, obviously, um, all of the fun stuff that adults do to our bodies that, that mm-hmm. cause, cause damage. Uh, how big is IR in the pediatric world and what are you seeing there? So, so pediatric IR is very different. It, it's a much smaller, uh, community. Um, obviously there aren't as many positions because, you know, they're mainly based at children's hospitals. The, um, the workflow is very different um, because, um, you know, with pediatrics, um, almost all the cases are done with uh, anesthesia. So, so that the one thing with IR is, uh, although we use uh, general anesthesia, the vast majority of our cases are done with conscious sedation, which is a sort of you're in a twilight. So, if you shake the patient and call their name, they'll be able to respond. That's the whole um, uh, premise of. Uh, of IRS to keep it minimally invasive. Well, um, you know, uh, asked me to come over for some congenital vascular uh, issues uh, in kids to see how we can help. Yeah. Uh, a question here, if you have a physical disability, I'm sure this is super specific to what the disability is, but if you have a mm-hmm. physical disability, interventional radiology seems like you, you need good use of both hands for the most part. Yes, uh, that and, you know, um, you know, uh, 
obviously, you know, to be able to, uh, to stand and wear lead, you know, you're wearing 20 pounds of lead, uh, you know, every day. Um, so as you said, it really depends on what the, uh, what the disability is. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting. Interesting. All right. Let me, uh, bring on some students here, get some, some more questions going. Um, fellow New York med graduate. Um, it's always, it's always fun to, to talk mm-hmm. to some mm-hmm. alumni from, from New York medical college. Uh, what, what is your most fond memory of New York medical college? Oh, you know, besides, besides meeting certain people, <laughs> you know, I, my fondest although, memory although, was, although, I'll, I'll take yeah, that back. You, you yeah. didn't meet your wife at New York med, right? You, you met later and you just happened yes. to go to the same school. Yes. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She was, um, I was a fourth year when she was a, a first year, but our paths yeah. did not cross. Yeah. Um, so I would say my, um, was really, uh, I thought the, the clinical education uh, of working in in New York City hospitals was probably the best you know experience. You know, I, I had uh, some choices for for med school, and you know, one of those, oh, you know, do I sort of you know stay in the Midwest where I was from, or do I you know go to New York? And you know, my father's a cardiovascular surgeon, and um, and he trained at Kings County in Brooklyn, and, and he said to me, he said, look, he said. If there's just one time in your life that you could live in New York and do it during medical school. And he yeah. said, let me tell you the training that you will get and what you will be exposed to. He, he said, you won't get it anywhere else. And, yeah. and he was right. Um, and I think that really opened my eyes for all the uh, uh, rotations that we do. I, this case that you ever come across. So um, my, the, the craziest case, and I'm trying to see if I can uh, find it to show uh, everyone uh, was a case that I did about three years ago. And uh, this uh, was a uh, 19-year-old boy, uh, you know, otherwise uh, healthy, who uh, was um, a college student at uh, Penn State, and he was playing basketball, and you know, got a little tired, and you know, looked down at his legs, and his legs were swollen, and uh, so he went to the ER, and he had a, a deep vein thrombosis. He had blood clots in both legs, so um, the. They're the surgeons. They uh, took him uh, to get the clots out, and they were unable to get the clots out because they found that um, he did not. He was born without the main vein in our body, the vena cava, um, and uh, and he, you know, through these nineteen years, the only thing that he had had was that he would get really nauseous uh, when he did physical activity, and he had seen GI doctors, had gotten scopes done. No one could find anything. Uh, but you know, really, he, he would get nauseated when he really did, you know, a, a, you know, physical activity, uh, and um, and then when they found that his, you know, that he was born without a cava, it was pretty much well, look, there's nothing you can do. Uh, to, it, veins are very, very difficult to bypass. So his mother called us, and uh, you know, she found me on the internet, and you know, I spoke with the surgeons, and they said, you know, the family wants to transfer, you know, their son, but we don't really see what the point is because he doesn't have a vena cava. There's nothing to do here. <laughs> um, and, you know, I had read about it, you know, like vena cava, it was collateral veins that were draining his entire abdomen and lower body for the past 19 years. And, but his body had just become so used to it. That's why he didn't have massive leg swelling. His legs looked perfectly normal, but now all those collateral veins said, they said, you know what? We're done. We're done. <laughs> we're done. We're we're not working like this. We were not they designed. Said I quit. Yeah, they said I quit. And I was like, <laughs> oh my, you know, and I was like, oh my God, what am, what are we gonna do for this 19 year old? Because his, you know, his future life is is gonna be horrendous. Um, and so we um we put him in the intensive care unit that night, and that night I went home and I read embryology. God my Last time I read embryology was a medical student. I had to read about how the vena cava develops. And um, we brought him back the next day. And it took us 14 hours. But we found a one centimeter remnant of vena cava that never developed. And from his pelvis all the way up to the right atrium of his heart, we completely reconstructed his uh, vena cava. And, um, he, he's three years out, he has no issues. He's doing very well. And, um, there was a huge write up in the paper about it. Uh, and 
From that, we have done so many of these cases. People sprung up out of the woodwork across the country. It's very rare, but mm. it's like you know, 0.01% of the population, but 0.01% of 350 million people, you get a decent number of patients. Mm -hmm. um, so wow. that was probably the, the best case that, uh, that I have done. It was, there's just a lot that went into that, like the stamina that you had to have, the fact that there was like the sliver, the sliver of being For us that you wish, oh, I wish I could look at it this way, you know, from a tech, futuristic technolog technological standpoint, what do you wish you had today within the realm of possibility that we can contribute <laughs> to future? <laughs> no. Mark, Mark is out there playing yeah. his entrepreneurial. Uh, yeah, endeavors. yeah, yeah. Well, we, we need people like you in our, yeah. in our field because it, it's all about, you know, coming up with the next uh, uh, device. You know, um, you know, boy, um, there are a lot of different things. I think for, you know, for what I do, you know, I use a lot of devices to uh, open up blood vessels, whether it's in the artery or the vein. And so one thing that has, uh, that is being worked on is uh, biodegradable stents. Um, you know, just like people get stents in the heart. Um, you know, but the problem is our stents are made of metal. And you're put, you're implanting a permanent piece of metal in a patient, and sometimes, you know, if the patient's let's say, you know, like this kid, 19 years old, I'm putting, you know, uh, all that metal, you know, in him, and you know, there are problems that can happen with, you know, with stents. What would be nice is if, if you, if there was a a stent that, when put in, let's say, it lasted a year. And enough that, that that the body sort of remodeled around the stent, and then the stent just sort of dissolved. You know, I, um, you know, and, and that's something that you know is being talked about. There are some you know studies out there, but you know, nothing has really come to fruition. Is the main concern with this is sort of a immune um, response to a metal or, or non organic matter? Well, whenever you have a piece of metal, and yes, you can have rejection, but you can have thrombosis. The the stent can completely block, and when it blocks, then you have to reopen it. And each time you reopen it, it's um, you know uh, less and less you know chance that it's going to stay open. Understood. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. All right. Love. Very, very entrepreneurial question. What challenges <laughs> you're having that I can go solve and make a, <laughs> a bajillion dollars? <laughs> Vivian. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that um, patients from all over the country travel to see you for your particular practice. Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering if those particular individuals are coming to see you because their local IRs weren't able to help them with their case yeah. or if there's another reason surrounding that travel. So uh, very good question. Uh, and uh, generally it's because uh, the physicians in their area, whether it's IR, vascular, and they learn about uh, you know, what can be done. The other thing that I do is, you know, you really come to find that it is not easy to travel for healthcare. And for the types of cases that I do, there are only maybe 10 of us in the country who are doing these really complex vascular uh, cases. And um, so I will try to refer, you know, people, you know, like, in, like, for example, in Colorado, where Ryan is, there's actually an interventional radiologist there, uh, in Denver, who is uh, superb, who does similar work uh, to what I do, and and uh, she and I are very close. So if someone from California reaches out to me, I say, look, rather than traveling all the way to Philadelphia, go see this physician in Denver. Love it. And it it goes to um, the fact that all of us are little mini businesses. Right. And and social media has allowed us to and, and some people think it's corny. Some people think it's ridiculous. But but physicians need to be on social media. You need to have a website. You need to be out there spouting off being an evangelist for what you believe in, what you're an expert in, because patients will find you and they will come to you if they resonate with your message, if they will connect with you. It's, it's so huge. It, it, it is huge. And, you know, the, my surgical training, um, I, I don't uh, regret it at all. It, it, it has made me, you know, who I am. And one of the, you know, there are pros and cons to every field. 
Okay, and one of the things that uh, other specialties have said about IR is that um, IRs uh, don't know how to manage patients. You know, they they they're just technicians. They they do the procedure and and that's it. And there is you know there is some truth to that. And there's a reason why there's a lot of turf wars or political battles between IR and other specialties. So we you know many of you uh, you know. Um, Maybe familiar with uh, the procedure of angioplasty, which is just opening up a blocked vessel. Um, many people think that you know, um, you know, the surgeons or the cardiologists invented that. That was actually invented by interventional radiology, the uh, uh, you know angioplasty. But you know, but people don't know that. And who's who's keeping score? Yeah, who's keeping score? <laughs> yeah, but when you look at, for example, um, you know, heart angioplasty and stenting, it used to be. That if you, you know, came in uh, uh, with a heart attack, the cardiologist who years ago was not doing procedures would send you down to the basement where the interventional radiologist was. And the interventional radiologist is the one who put the stent in your heart. And then you would go back to your room and the cardiologist would say, well, Mr. Smith, we fixed your heart. Well, we was the person down in the basement, but the interventional radiologist never came up and saw the patient. So that's when the cardiologist said, "You know what? We're gonna we're gonna learn this and we're gonna take over." So, over the past fifteen years, IR has had a huge uh, change in um, uh, the way they're training uh, uh, the physicians, and now all the new uh, 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 new people coming out are all getting that clinical training. and flying a lot. And I was wondering whether you have like had a patient who like you know flies a lot, whether it's for business or for leisure. And they develop deep vein thrombosis because of that. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I treated a uh, college uh, student um, who uh, was flying back from uh, Thailand, and um, she uh, developed a massive uh, DVT. And uh, we uh, were able to, uh, you know, to get it out. But when she landed at Philadelphia Airport. Um, you know, her leg was massively swollen. And, um, and so she came to the ER and we were able to, you know, uh, you know, uh, to open things up. So we do see it, um, whether it's a, a long plane ride, a long car ride. Um, it, it is, uh, it is something that is, you know, fairly common. Is there, is there any extra physiology that's different because of the, the altitude and lower pressure, lower oxygen level, or is it literally just sitting and not moving? So, so it's a combination. So when, when you're at that altitude, it's very um, uh, dehydrating uh, for the body. And then you combine that with just sitting in one uh, position with your legs dependent and the blood is just pooling uh, there in your legs. Um, that's really what becomes the the setup for for deep vein thrombosis. Yeah. So you know they th there's some literature out there. No one knows it. You know, is it a a, a six hour flight, a twelve hour flight? Um, some people say like anything over four hours is what sort of increases your uh, your risk of getting a uh, you know a DVT. Yeah. But um, I, I think it's really you just have to uh, stay active, stay well hydrated. Uh, you know when you're uh, you know, when you're on a plane. Yeah. Or when you're studying for the MCAT people, keep those legs moving. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's important. You see happening in the future. Great question. So I, I, I think the main thing that IR um, is, is facing and, and they're continuing to, to work on is uh, developing the, uh, uh, the whole sort of uh, clinical uh, management and evaluation of the uh, patient. Um, one of the things that I didn't realize is how much politics there is within the field of radiology. So, for example, um, um, if a private practice uh, vascular surgeon or a cardiologist goes to, you know, Joe's Community Hospital and says, you know what? I just moved here. I want to start bringing my patients here and, you know, and start operating. No one's going to say anything. They say, okay, you apply for privileges, you get them and, you know, start bringing you all the serve, all the radiology services, which includes IR to Joe's community hospital. And in that contract, they say 
no outside interventional radiologist can step foot in this hospital. So even if that interventional radiologist has a huge practice and can bring in millions of dollars in uh, revenue to a hospital, they cannot set up shop there because, um, uh, because the hospital has an exclusive contract with this private radiology group. And if they break that, then um, there's a legal battle uh, there. No other specialty sort of has that. I have, I'm going to try to show, I've got a case. I don't know if oh, you- Oh yeah, let's do it. So this was a really interesting case. So uh, this is a 33-year-old female who had a history of left flank pain for about a year that began in 2015. She had uh, no hematuria, no kidney stones, no DVT, no leg swelling, just this chronic pelvic pain as well as dyspruenia, which is pain with uh, intercourse. She went to the ER in 2016 because the flank pain was just getting worse, and she was found to have left renal vein thrombosis. She was started on anticoagulation and told to follow up with a vascular specialist. Now, what you are seeing here, this is a CAT scan, and uh, what the arrow is pointing to is this is the left renal vein. So here's the vena cava right here where my arrow is, and then this is the left renal vein. And you can see how it becomes very tiny and very thin, and the left renal vein is getting san sandwiched between this big circle here, which is the aorta, and the little guy here, which is the superior mesenteric artery. And uh, that is called nutcracker uh, syndrome. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, original name there. So uh, nutcracker syndrome, and there are a few different ways to treat nutcracker syndrome. One is to put a stent into the left renal vein and sort of prop it open. Um, but the problem is, is this is one of the hardest places in the body to land a stent. There's a very high rate of stent migration, meaning the stent won't stay here. It actually flies up the vena cava and goes to your heart. And we, we've seen cases like that where people are just, you know, uh, pretty much drop dead on the table because um, it happens immediately uh, many times. So I actually don't do this procedure. Uh, and so another uh, way to treat it is with open surgery. And, um, uh, but we don't have to, uh, you know, go into that. So she was diagnosed with uh, nutcracker syndrome and uh, at an outside hospital, they put a stent in and you can see here is the stent. Mm. Okay. And this is the vena cava right here. Okay. So, you know, for the most part, it looks good. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is you see how this stent is almost going and touching the other side of the vena cava. Now you're just seeing this in sort of two dimensions. So you're not seeing a three dimension, but you know, this um, piece of metal, it could potentially be touching the contralateral wall of the, uh, of the vena cava. It may not seem like a big deal at first. Well, <laughs> no problem. well, her left flank pain completely went away and she was fine for about a year. And then she started to develop abdominal wall varicosities. Yeah. She started to get shortness of breath and bilateral leg swelling. She went back uh, you know, to the uh, physician who put the uh, stent in and he said, everything's fine. They did an ultrasound. They said, the stent looks great. And he said, this is all cosmetic. Oh. Eh, no way, this <laughs> is never cosmetic if you see this on the abdomen. So he sent her to a cosmetic vein specialist and fortunately, that guy was an interventional radiologist, and he took one look and he said, uh-uh, we, we don't treat this. There's something wrong here. And he said, you need a CAT scan. And um, she went and got a CAT scan, and it turns out, you can see here exactly what happened. This stent migrated. See how it's sort of kind of falling down here? Fortunately, it migrated this way and not up to her heart because she would have been dead. But it sort of migrated down, and it caused complete IVC thrombosis all the way down her iliac veins in both legs. So, um, you know, she comes, uh, you know, a couple of years, a uh, couple of years later. Now, the worst part is when she went back to the physician, he said that you were you were born uh, uh, you were born without a vena cava, and um, that um, you know this is just uh, something that's manifesting now because he was trying to take it. To, advantage of the fact that she did not really have any medical background. And so he said, look, there's nothing to do. This is a chronic 
um, you know, uh, issue. Um, but his images right here show that the vena cava is open. <laughs> that's, that's right so, <laughs> yeah, it, it's open. So, <laughs> you know, so this is her in 2016. Uh, so now we did, we, she comes to me, we do a vena. And I'm like, oh my God, well, this is why she has back pain. You know, uh, these, these back vessels are so engorged. Now, what's interesting is her stent is actually open. You know, you can see contrast within the stent, but right here, that's where the occluded IVC starts. Okay, so what we did is it took us a while, but we got a wire up through the blocked cava and we um, sort of crushed or displaced this uh, stent here. Um, and I took a big stent and I squashed that other stent, uh, squashed it away. Okay, and now let's see if. Uh, let's see when it works. Maybe the video isn't working. Yeah, uh, I guess it's not working. But um, but you um, but you can see now that after we reconstructed her IVC, um, all the collaterals are are gone. And trying to uh, I don't can, minute, can you show a before and after of her bank account after she sued the original <laughs> physician? <laughs> and she's no, she's not suing. You know, she's just one of she's like you know. Um, you know, but, um, you know, but this, so this is, uh, you know, after I did that 19, uh, year old three years, uh, three years ago, um, a case, you know, if I would have gotten a case like this, you know, um, before I did that, a 19 year old, I think it would have been much more challenging, you know, for me. And I don't know if I would have been successful, but now I've done so many of these cases. Uh, so, um, but each one is, uh, you know, is a challenge and she is completely back to normal. You, you can't tell that she has anything, you know, uh, done to her. Uh, now she has to be on blood thinners for the rest of her life, but, um, you know, sort of a small price, a uh, small price to pay. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's a, a, a great case to, to wrap up on, um, and it's very interesting that she didn't bring a malpractice suit knowing that she's going to be on medication that's not benign for the rest of her life. Uh, right. That's, that's very interesting. Right. <sighs> Dr. Sudindra, thank you so much for spending some time. Uh, tell the lovely people where to find you online because you got a great presence. Yes. Um, you know, uh, you could find me on, uh, on Twitter at Dr. Underscore Sudi. Uh, you can also... Um, uh, check out my website, which is called gethealthyveins.com. Uh, I am at uh, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, the Perlman School of Medicine, uh, and I've been here for you know for over a decade. Uh, so if anyone ha you know has any questions, uh, you know, type my name in LinkedIn. You know, there's uh, you know just stick my name in Google, you'll find it. <laughs> you will find it uh, in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having Thank you, me. everyone, for hanging out. Have a good night. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Bye.